The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, the true story of an army chaplain. I began to snap. Who brought the battle home with him. Didn't matter if she was right or wrong. Now the story of this marriage is playing out on the big screen. This was going to go nowhere. It's going to get worse. The real life husband and wife behind the new movie, Indivisible, joins us live on today's 700 Club. Welcome, folks. As we told you yesterday, Michael was a Category 3, but it's moved into a Category 4. They say it's going to be the worst storm ever to hit the Gulf Coast of Florida. Never in history has anything of this powerful come across. 145 miles per hour. And uh, not only is it a Category 4, but on the edges it will be spawning uh, not only uh, tornadoes, but hurricanes. You know, in Richmond, that last storm, they had 13 hurricanes, and they who knows how many is this thing goes inland. But it's moving very rapidly, and it'll be soon. Uh, it'll sweep up through Georgia, Alabama, and then uh, into the Carolinas, and uh, it's going right on up. It'll, as a matter of fact, in another day or two, it'll be up here in Virginia where we live. It's just unbelievable. But as I say, it's the strongest in 150, maybe ever years. I say 150 years, but maybe ever. Mm. But um, the, the death toll and the storm surge is going to be monumental. If anybody has tried to uh, uh, weather it out, they're making a big mistake. It's going to be devastating. Yeah, Wendy. I just hope people have had time to get out. But Michael is expected to make landfall near Panama City Beach today. The Panhandle faces devastating wind damage, catastrophic storm surges of up to 13 feet or more. As Charlene Aaron tells us, Florida is under a high state of emergency. Overnight, Michael strengthened to a monster Category 4 storm, taking direct aim at the Florida Panhandle. Do not underestimate the power of this storm. This will be devastating. There are concerns Michael could strengthen before making landfall later today. We're talking about landfall this afternoon near Panama City Beach. Gust up to 160 miles per hour. Movement here still keeps us the hurricane into early tonight. That's going to be well north of the tens. We're talking about widespread trees down, power lines down, but again, making landfall mid afternoon as a category four hurricane. Forecasters warn the storm could become one of the panhandle's worst hurricanes in memory. This is the worst storm to ever strike the Florida panhandle. There, hands down, it's going to beat Opal, going to blow away Dennis. Uh, from 2005, and it's one of only a handful of storms in the past 30 years that's hitting as intense as it, ha as it has been. Some 375,000 people up and down the Gulf Coast have been urged or ordered to evacuate ahead of life-threatening storm surge, hurricane force winds, and heavy rainfall. Remember, we can rebuild your house, we cannot rebuild your life. Think about your kids, your grandkids, all your family members. Take care of them. Take this ser seriously and keep your family safe. Some are heeding the warning, taking to shelters. Understanding that this storm may be a little bit more intense than the others, so I think it's a good idea if people are concerned that they have an option, come here or some of the other shelters. Others plan to ride out the storm. We're hunkered down the way we need to be. We're well prepared. We understand the severity and uh, we'll be good to go. While Michael is likely to weaken as it moves across the southeastern United States, its heavy rains and flooding effects will spread far and wide. Tropical storm watches are in effect in coastal areas of Mississippi, Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. Uh, the problem in the Carolinas, this is a, the kind of storms going to knock down some trees and power lines in areas that they've just put it back up. But there's going to be a swath of three to six locally 12-inch rains in the areas that Florence hit. And those rivers aren't back in their banks yet in a lot of cases. So that's going to re-aggravate flood problems. President Trump has declared a state of emergency in Florida, authorizing FEMA to coordinate relief efforts and provide federal money and help. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. You know, uh, Wendy, I went down shortly after Hugo hit South Carolina, and um, it was like somebody had taken an axe and the trees just 
thousands of them were yeah. cut off, right, you know, at about three feet above uh, their base, and just chopped down thousands of trees. Same thing's going to happen uh, down there in Florida. All that uh, pine uh, foliage is there, the, those trees. They'll be wiped out. It, it'll be devastating. They have no conception of how bad it's going to be. I, uh, I was living in South Carolina right before Hugo. I went back to, uh, because my parents had a place down there. And the bridges, you couldn't even get to the bridges to well, check your, the damage yeah. of what was going on. But anything that wasn't sturdy was gone. I mean, it was just no more. You know, I remember we set up our, our uh, cameras in the main street of Charleston because there wasn't anybody there. And uh, there was a roof of one of the commercial buildings. It was a tin roof, and it, it was like a piece of paper. You know, you, you get a piece of paper, and you, 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 you do it like this. That's what that was. It was, it was balled up like that, and it thrown down in the middle of the street. Uh, that, that was so devastating, but I think... The people of the Panhandle have no conception of what this thing is going to do to them. And boy, if there's any possibility of getting, it may be too late now to to, to get out. I think. Just hit, hit today, this afternoon. Um, I mean, the reporters that were on the TV this morning said it's eight hours away. So, you know, by the time this the, airs, it'll be uh, seven hours. The, the roads are all jammed up. With the, well, this is one of those that they should be doing something about. Now, Operation Blessing is mobilizing to help storm victims in Florida. Our representatives will be on the ground assessing needs and working with churches and government agencies to provide assistance once the storm clears. We'll have water, we'll have uh, cots, we'll have tents, we'll have uh, tarps, we'll have food, we'll have all that kind of stuff and medical assistance. So I think it's so important. So we'll swing away from that. He, we mentioned uh, South Carolina. Uh, there's a young lady who was governor down there. As I understand, she's from a uh, well, a, a background of Hindu of faith, hmm. and she is a dedicated Christian, a wonderful person, and has been a superb governor and one of the best UN ambassadors we have ever had, Nikki Haley. She's now said, "Look, I've, I've had eight years." In government service, and I'm I'm going to set step down. I'm giving my notice well in advance, and um, at the end of this year, she'll be replaced. So who's who's she going to replace her? Uh, well, the, there's several. One is the uh, executive at Goldman Sachs, and the G ambassador at Germany is another. They're under consideration. John Jessup has more on that story. That's right, Pat. As we were saying, President Trump has a list of names to replace outgoing Ambassador Nikki Haley at the United Nations, but he's taking some time to make his decision. Haley's announcement that she's leaving the administration surprised many, but not the president. CBN's White House correspondent Ben Kennedy has more. Haley initially told President Trump of her plans to resign about six months ago. She now made it official and plans to stay at her post until the end of the year. I think you have to be selfless enough to know when you step aside and allow someone else to do the job. So thank you, Mr. President. You, it's Mr. been an Mr. honor of a lifetime. UN Ambassador Nikki Haley becomes the latest in a line of high profile departures from the White House. It was a blessing to go into the UN with body armor every day and defend America. She represented the U.S. with a strong voice at the U.N., speaking out on North Korea, Russia, and Iran. Haley went on the attack against Syria's President Bashar al-Assad for the use of chemical weapons on civilians. The monster who was responsible for these attacks has no conscience, not even to be shocked by pictures of dead children. She stood up for those without a voice when the U.S. withdrew from the U.N. Human Rights Council. When a so-called Human Rights Council cannot bring itself to address the massive abuses in Venezuela and Iran, and it welcomes the Democratic Republic of Congo as a new member, the council ceases to be worthy of its name. While at the same time fighting for Israel. I think you look at the anti-Israel bias and the strength and courage that the president showed in moving the embassy. She cited her Christian faith as a reason to support Israel, later teaming up with the president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, to work toward a peace deal with the Palestinians. What I've done working with him on the Middle East peace plan, it is so unbelievably well done. Haley sat down with CBN's chief analyst, David Brody, to talk about her impact on the UN. Since day one, you've gone in there to shake things up. Um, how tough is that 
been? Every day I put on body armor because I know there's going to be a fight. I'm just fighting a different thing every day. Senators confirmed the former South Carolina governor as U.S. ambassador to the U.N. on day four of Trump's presidency by a vote of 96 to four. She will end up serving nearly two years at her post, citing it was time to step aside. You've been fantastic. You're my friend. And I just on behalf of the country, I want to thank you for a great job. Thank you. Now, President Trump said he will name a successor in the next two or three weeks. As for what's next, Haley said she will not run in 2020 and will support President Trump's reelection. Ben Kennedy, CBN News, the White House. Thanks, Ben. And President Trump says he's narrowed his list of possible replacements down to five people. And he reportedly, and one name uh, reportedly on the list is former Deputy National Security Advisor Dina Powell. Israelis were as surprised as Americans at the resignation of Ambassador Haley following the announcement that she'd wrap up her two-year tenure at the United Nations. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu tweeted, I would like to thank Ambassador Nikki Haley, who led the uncompromising struggle against hypocrisy at the UN and on behalf of the truth and justice of our country. On the sidelines of September's General Assembly, Prime Minister Netanyahu told Haley she helped roll back anti-Semitism at the UN. The hall still permeates with the stench yes. of uh, anti-Israel and anti-Semitic resolutions, which are the same. And I want to thank you for clearing the air. And Pat, he added that Haley was one of the best friends Israel has had at the United Nations in a long time. Well, uh, frankly, ladies and gentlemen, I believe the United Nations has served its purpose and should be replaced. I, I counsel and I, I still counsel uh, some kind of a uh, conference or, or of, of democratic nations. And that's what we need because the General Assembly is just a joke. Time after time, they pass anti-American and anti-Israeli resolutions over and over again. They never say anything about Assad. They never say anything about uh, any of the uh, Arab dictators. They never say anything about Soviet Russia. They always talk about America and Israel. It is just a, an exercise in futility. Those people are overpaid. They get a lot more money than our uh, foreign diplomats. They live in great luxury, and uh, they couldn't care less about what they're doing. They just vote willy-nilly on these things. And, you know, we've got the Security Council, and uh, the Security Council under Obama failed to uh, object to a resolution against Israel, which was just, uh, well, it was, it was threatening to the whole nation. It, it made them an outlaw state. And the United States has the power of veto in the Security Council. The thing is set up there. The General Assembly is a big debating body, but they have no real power. The power is in the Security Council. and. It's a, a few of the leaders of the, of the nations who were f fighting against Nazi Germany in World War II. And so uh, we have a veto in that, but it's, it's just, it's a waste of money. We, we, we're taking up maybe 40% of their budget, 30% or so, is paid for by the American uh, taxpayer. I think it's time to stop. And we ought to reconstitute a, a community of democratic nations would be the answer. And I think that's what's got to be done. But I don't know if there's any uh, political will to do that or not. They, they, they would scream at you. But when you see the people who are on there, for example, as Nikki Haley talked about their so-called human rights council, and then you've got these vicious dictators. I mean, it's just a, it's just a farce what they're doing. They, they, it's a waste of money. And it's time we get another organization uh, that will, will be more effective. That's World War II, and it's been 40, 50, 60 years, however many years it's been since its creation. Now it's time for a new world order. Wendy. I'm really going to miss her. Do you think she'll uh, reemerge in some other office oh, at some point? Of course she will. I mean, she's, she's too popular. I, I don't know if, you know, Senate, I mean, after having been a uh, uh, the main focus of the of the United States of the General Assembly, she she was free. Uh, I don't know. There might be some appointive position, but she'd make a great Secretary of State, for example. I mean, if if Pompeo. That's was, what I'm wondering. I'm wondering if that's in the cards at some well, time in the future. Her and Trump. Right. I think I think everybody loves her, and so uh, <laughs> what we do. I mean, you know, she's got a family. She's she's maybe she just wants to take it easy for a while. Hey.
That yeah, sounds good, too. <laughs> got to strap on body armor every day to fight the fight. So, yeah. you know, you get tired of fighting. Well, God bless her and pray for this wonderful lady. All right. Amen. Well, still ahead. There are men who risked their lives and defied their homelands to save the lives of countless Jews. Hear the stories of the heroes who've been called righteous among the nations when we come back. Well, many of you have, like I, I have, have traveled to Jerusalem and you've gone to a place called Yad Vashem, which is the memorial to the victims of the Holocaust. And outside that is something that's called the Garden of the Righteous Gentiles. And people who fought for the Jewish cause, like Corey Ten Boom, are remembered there, or maybe some are buried there. But uh, there's another group, they're called the Righteous Among the Nations, foreign diplomats who help rescue hundreds of Jews from Nazi Holocaust. CBN has partnered with the Israeli government to bring a special ex exhibition to Regent University. It honors those who, those who risk their lives to save others. Gary Lane gives us a look at it. Beyond Duty is a Holocaust remembrance display not only honoring Holocaust survivors, but also courageous foreign diplomats who helped rescue them. Earlier this year, the United Nations allowed the Israeli Foreign Ministry permission to display the exhibit there. And now the exhibit is on the road, with the latest stop being the CBN Regent University campus in Virginia Beach. Among some of the righteous diplomats featured in this exhibit, Raoul Wallenberg, he was from Sweden. Many of us know about him, but how many of us have ever heard about Sebastian de Romero Radigales? He was from Spain. Stories of bold diplomats from nations like Peru and Japan are also featured. Professor Gerson Moreno Riano is with Regent University. Regent has a long history of standing with the people of Israel and the state of Israel. Um, and the chancellor, our founder, Dr. Pat Robertson, loves the people of Israel, loves the state of Israel. So for us, this is just one more in a long series of things that we have done in partnering in, with the local Jewish community and the state of Israel. It highlights you know, the importance of embodying moral courage in the face of evil. I think that today, in today's world especially, I think young people, students, others need to see and understand history. Israel's CBN and Regent University a unique partnership broadening Holocaust awareness by honoring 36 courageous diplomats and thousands of others called the righteous among the nations. Joining us now with more on the Beyond Duty exhibit is Benjamin Krasna. He's deputy head of mission for the Embassy of Israel of the United States. And it's nice to see you with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome, Pat. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Tell me about this exhibit. Who, who are these people, these wonderful people? Well, these are diplomats from around the world mm -hmm. who refuse to sit silent. Um, their governments probably would have preferred inaction to stay out of it, to not get involved. But they saw what was happening to Jews in Europe. They saw what the plan of the Nazis, and they felt that they couldn't stay silent. And so they went beyond the call of duty mm -hmm. and helped enable many of them to escape the Holocaust. And for that, we're very, very grateful. Well, did many of them risk their lives? Or did the Nazis try to kill them, or were they, were they spared? Well, many of them obviously had risked their lives, risked their careers. The most famous example, of course, is Raoul Wallenberg, who yeah. to this day, we actually don't know what his fate has been. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it was a time of great risk of what the Nazis may do and what their own governments, how they may react. You know, is there any possibility that that would be repeated? We've all said never again, it can't ever happen again, but is there a possibility? Well, Pat, I think it's why there's such an important lesson here. Yeah. You know, the generation of those who actually remember the Holocaust, the survivors, the people, those diplomats, they're no longer with us or many of them will not be with us for for much longer. And so it's important that we have a way to eternalize this lesson so that we can teach the younger people, they can see this generation, so that when we face something like the tyrants in Iran mm -hmm. who declare they want desire to annihilate the Jewish people, to deny the Holocaust, to wipe out the state of Israel, people understand why we have to take such things seriously. Do you think the young people today, because I, I, I was there when this stuff was going on. I was younger, but I, I remember. Uh, 
do you think the youth of today have an appreciation of what the Jews went through under? They don't even. They think Hitler was a kind of a nice guy, don't they? Yeah, look, it's a shame. It's, I mean, it has to be more than just a history lesson. Yeah. It has to be a lesson about morality. It has to be a lesson about taking action and not standing by quietly and calling out when they see wrong and doing what they can to save people. You've got the title righteous among the nations. Does that you want to explain that a little bit? Well, again, I think that many of us would have expected Jews to help Jews. Yeah. Um, that was obviously there was many movements to do that, but again, even there were many Jews, unfortunately, who were who were silent. But this was something else. This was people who just saw the wrong and saw the evil, and then took these righteous, brave acts, mm -hmm. um, and therefore to meet and to help and facilitate people from Turkey, from, as you say, from Japan, from uh, Cuba, from all over the world who actually took this action. Is the one that stands out in your mind that he's kind of like a hero for you? Well, look, for me, there's a, there's a certain fact. I, I started my service, my first place abroad was serving in Istanbul, Turkey. Uh -huh. And so Selahattin Okomen is mentioned that a, a, a Turkish diplomat who saved many Jews and enabled them to expect from, from Rhodes and so to me, I had the opportunity to meet him when I first served there. Oh, oh yeah. And so to me, it was really a, a, a great moment to meet someone who was, who was so brave and so modest. And I think that, that combination is what made it special. Uh, you mentioned Turkey, uh, the current president. Uh, what is his attitude, do you think? I mean, is he setting up an Islamic dictatorship? Is he, is he for Israel or against Israel? Or what, is he, what do you think? Look, I have a tremendous amount of affinity for the Turkish people. Uh -huh. I, I serve there. I speak the language somewhat. Um, and I saw the great, great potential, the great, great potential of the relationship between the country. You know, I, I saw the opening segment where you talked about the humanitarian aid, the amazing humanitarian aid that you're doing today yeah. in the South. And I know that you're doing also now in Indonesia, where there are also Israelis now assisting in Indonesia. I had the opportunity in the earthquakes in 1999, I had the opportunity to work with our search and rescue teams. And it really was a, a tremendous, tremendous opportunity to see the outpouring. And the Israelis were the first on the ground with the largest numbers, saved people. I witnessed it myself. And really, it was a, a tremendous, tremendous opportunity. So the, 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 the Turks are so, well, you know, actually, that was the fountainhead of Christianity, was Turkey in the early days. But uh, anyhow, well, I, I commend you on this exhibit. Now, this exhibit is coming to Regent University. We're honored to have it here for a couple of weeks, maybe. Right. We had the opportunity last night uh, with Gordon to open it. Um, it was a wonderful turnout, working together with the university, with CBN, with the local Jewish community. And so we're really very, very proud. And I think it's so appropriate that it be at a university, that it be in a place to educate so that the young people can see it, because they really need to be our target audiences. Well, thank you for being with us, Benjamin Krasner. Thank you so much. And the exhibit, by the way, is going to be at Regent University. It runs today through October the 23rd. And uh, you can get more uh, information or schedule a group visit. Uh, go to region.com, edu, or call 888-372-1006. Thank you so much. Thank God you bless you. Thank you. All right. Wendy. Thanks, Pat. Well, coming up, 15 years of chronic pain vanishes in an instant. And I couldn't believe it. And I was so happy because he, he healed me. Hear her story of miraculous healing when we come back. Can you imagine you wake up in the morning and you start stretching and you start counting how much pain places you've got? You know, ah, 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 your knees, your hips, your shoulders, your arms, your elbows. Well, that's nine out of 10. That's how Chana Monroe describes the pain she felt every day. Her problems stretch from her legs to her head, locked up her body, and kept her in a constant state of discomfort. And then one day, Chanda was deciding whether to call in sick or to go to a chiropractor. She did neither, and look what happened to Chandra. Shanda Monroe from Aurora, Colorado, cleans homes for a living. Although she lived with chronic hip and back pain, she continued to work whenever she could. I've had a lot of pain off and on probably for the last 15 years. You can imagine that 
that could really hurt your back when you're bending and swooping and um, twisting and all that. In July of 2018, Shanda's suffering reached a new level. When the pain was at its worst, um, I would just have to sit or go to bed and maybe sometimes put ice on the area and I don't know, just pray about it. It's, it, it kept me from doing a lot of things. I felt so much pain that I didn't even want to go to work. On July 19th of that same year, Shanda was debating about going to work or going to her chiropractor. Then there was the third option. I had a feeling that God told me to turn on um, the 700 Club and it was about 8.30 a.m. I turned it on and Brenda Sipes had her story. And she had a story about her neck being injured in a car accident, I think. And it was really bad. I saw her put her hand upon her neck and they prayed for her. And she said, I have no more pain. And as soon as she said that, I was watching and I said, I want that because I was in so much pain. And so I just continued to pray. And then Wendy and Pat, they decided to, you know, to pray and they were wrapping up the show. And so I said, okay, I'll pray with them. So I put my hand upon my back and Wendy said, You just saw this piece with, about Brenda's neck and you've had, um, it's not so much your neck, but your back. And you were asking for the same miraculous surgery to take place and God is saying yes today. Your spine is being completely healed. And I said, okay, God, I'm gonna stand up and I'm gonna walk around because I don't feel any pain. And so I walked, I got up and walked around and I started praising Jesus. I just said, oh my gosh, I have no more pain. Thank you, Lord. And I put my hands up in the air and I was thanking him and, and I couldn't believe it. And I was so happy because he, he healed me and I had no more pain. It was gone completely. I was able to go to work that day and feel no pain and for the rest of the week and for the rest of the next week and the week after. When she's not working, Shanda loves to spend time with her husband, Zach, and her children and two grandchildren. Since my healing, I'm able to pick up the kids and play with them and go to the park and walk the dogs. I love to share this story because I've never experienced this before and it was the most wonderful thing I've ever felt. I felt the Holy Spirit go from the bottom of my feet all the way up through my body and I knew it was God. I knew it was God. Wendy, you didn't know her, did you? No, not at all, but she seems like a very nice lady. I'd like to meet her. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that sweet? Oh, that makes me just so happy. It yeah, makes me want to cry. Yeah. Well, here, here are a few more. Somebody's got Munir's disease. And somebody's got have to have 35 mini strokes, 35 mini strokes mm -hmm. needs healing. And somebody, of course, says, we need to pray for revival throughout America. What do you have? Um, this person, I need a breakthrough after 40 years in the computer field. I cannot find a job due to my age. Don't say that. God can do anything. Uh, to, uh, this person to, needs to be delivered from anxiety and stress and need to be healed of all ulcerative colitis and fatty liver disease. Okay. A lot of needs out there. Folks, we want to pray for you. You've, you saw a lady crippled throughout her body, and yet in a matter of instance, God touched her. You see, we've got a God with all things are possible. Just keep that in mind. With God, everything is possible. Don't say, as, as you said, well, I, I'm too old to get a job. No, no, God's got plenty of jobs. God's got plenty of opportunity. God's got plenty of education, plenty of money, plenty of healing power. He is able to do all things. Nothing was impossible. So we're going to pray for you right now. Whatever the need is, you hold it before the Lord. We're going to pray together, and I'll join hands with Wendy, and the two of us will pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, I join with Wendy, and we pray together right now. And we ask that you would touch people. To somebody, it's, it's like a miasma. You've got a cloud all over you, in front of your face. You, you, there's something wrong, like, like you're walking through the, the fog, and that fog is going to lift right now in the name of Jesus. Marcia, you're healed in Jesus' name. Amen. So many people suffering with arthritis. Some of it is just so painful.
painful and debilitating and, and God sees your pain and He is touching you today. If you have arthritis, just start lifting your hands, praising God. You are Amen. being healed. Amen. You are You've got a, an ulcer. You've got an ulcer right in the middle of your stomach. It, it burns and it's so painful. And right now, it's going to be like a, a finger of fire just went into the inner part of your being right now, and you are completely healed in Jesus' name. Yeah, there's right. a gentleman with a, a bone spur in your foot, I believe, you, and Lord. God is touching you right now. You're being healed Thank you, Jesus. in Jesus' name. Oh, there's, there's a spirit of fear, uh, Melanie. You, you are freed from that perfect love cast out fear. Begin to praise God. You are delivered from fear. That spirit of fear is leaving you as we speak right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Please give us a call. Let us know what's happened. I, I think a lot of people got touched then, and especially the arthritis, fear, and so forth. God wants you to be healed. Give us a call. It's 1 800 700 7000. It's easy to remember. 1 800 700 7000. Tell us the good news, and if you want prayer requests, somebody's here on the, on the phone, phone ready to pray for you. And now we've got an expiring story. They made a movie out of it. They did, and I've seen it, and it's great. <laughs> Still ahead, an Army chaplain who tried to save lives in Iraq and save his own marriage at home. Here's the story that inspired the new movie, Indivisible. That's next. Welcome back to the 700 Club. The Congressional Leadership Fund is looking for more money for campaigns to help stop a Democratic takeover of the House. Reuters reports a memo released Tuesday stated the committee has already spent $90 million on key House races, but that wasn't enough. The memo warns donors that Democrats have outspent Republicans by $50 million. The memo did also show that voter approval of President Trump had risen by 5% percent across 20 critical House districts following the Kavanaugh controversy. A big ruling for religious freedom in the United Kingdom. After a four-year legal battle, Christian bakers in Northern Ireland won their Supreme Court case. Owners of Asher's Baking Company came under fire for refusing an order for a cake from a gay rights activist. The court held up a ruling Wednesday that Asher's acted lawfully and did not discriminate against anyone. Judges held it was the message the bakery objected to, not the customer. And you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, one moment, Darren Turner's mind wandered to the dozens of men wounded and killed while he was deployed in Iraq. The next moment, Darren had his kids begging him to go to the park and play. As an Army chaplain, Darren was a strong anchor of faith for his fellow soldiers, but he struggled to do the same at home. Darren Turner and his wife Heather had no idea how the war in Iraq would shake their rock-solid marriage to its core. In 2007, Darren, a Regent University grad, spent 15 months as an Army chaplain, encouraging servicemen and women in their faith. But when he came home, things quickly fell apart. I began to snap at, at little things, and uh, it didn't matter if she was right or wrong. That wasn't the point. It was an opportunity for me to uh, let some of my anger and frustration out. I knew something deeper, supernatural, that we could not manufacture had to happen, or else this was going to go nowhere. It was going to get worse. Darren and Heather's story hits the big screen in the movie Indivisible playing in theaters starting October 26th. And the movie's amazing. Well, Darren and Heather Turner, the real Darren and Heather Turner, are with us now. And welcome to the 700 Club, guys. Thank you for, having, for having us. Wow, it's so weird because I just, you know, saw the movie last night. I got finished watching it at midnight, and then they have the real, the pictures of the real family come on afterward. And so now here you are. Um, Darren, you were, you had several tours of duty over in Iraq. What was... The one depicted in the movie was your first tour, Correct. which was in incredible. What 
Can you even tell us what was that like for you? Yeah, so I actually went to seminary here. I was a Regent student, uh, graduated 2006, and then went on active duty the beginning of 2007, deployed for 15 months, three months after my first day on active duty. Wow. So it was fast. It was uh, part of President Bush's surge, if yeah. you recall that, oh, yeah. back in 2007 and eight. Mm -hmm. um, and so we went to Iraq for 15 months. And I remember in the movie, it's like, we're called to this, where you, you know, you were gonna just take it on. Um, and you get over there and it was, it was totally not what you expected, or worse than you expected. Yeah, I'm not sure I expected. I, I had no idea what to expect, honestly. I knew we were gonna go um, into a pretty hot combat zone. And it was, uh, and it it was. was pretty wild, yeah. And you ended up ministering to some soldiers who ended up losing their lives and that really affected you. It did. And Heather, um, you're home raising three kids and you guys are communicating a lot and at first it's, it's, everything seems fine, but then you start to notice he's not sounding like himself anymore. What was going on with you? I think for me, I just wanted to be able to connect to him in a way that I felt like he was heard and I was heard. But there's just, you know, practical issues. Back then during the deployments, um, you did just get your two-minute phone call, and there was this long delay. And, and so we would get off the phone feeling like we hadn't really said anything to each other. Two minutes. Oh, I didn't realize it was only. That's, that's tough. That's really tough. Before Skype, before smartphones, they had call centers at some of these deployed locations. Oh, man. And you had a limited amount of time. Wow. Well, at least you called. Yeah. Guys, just, guys just text today. Right, yeah. but, um, so when he got home after, it was 15 months, 15 right? 15 months. He wasn't the same man. Heather, what, how did that make you feel? What was going on? Yeah, he, neither of us were, were the same people. You know, you change anyway over that period of time, but having been in stressful situations just compounded that problem. And so he came back and I, the same thing, I didn't really have an expectation. I didn't know what. To expect, but I did expect that at least we would come back and be glad to see each other and, yeah. you know, sort of reconnect in a way. Um, but he was angry. Yes, he was just angry and disconnected. And Darren, why do you think you were taking your frustrations out on, on Heather? That's the million dollar question. <laughs> uh, I, I, as you mentioned, it was a tough deployment. I lost a lot of guys. She was there with the family, so I didn't fully appreciate what she had gone through on sure. that deployment. I only saw what I saw, mm -hmm. and vice versa. You didn't fully appreciate what, what happened with us, and so we came back feeling almost competitive, like we both had a better story than the <laughs> other one, and, and that, wow. that kind of fueled that anger a little bit. Sure, and the kids, they're caught in the crossfires. Yeah. How, how are they coping during this time? Well, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ellie, I remember, and we have pictures where she actually pulled her all of her eyelashes out, oh. and, and not consciously. She would not know that she had done it. But we have pictures where, I mean, she literally is missing all of her eyelashes, mm -hmm. and she would say if you asked her, you know, that she was fine. But clearly, there's a stress. And yeah. she was the daughter who has the asthma, right? Yes. And that was depicted so beautifully in the movie, and brings you to tears. And I. That little actress was amazing. I loved her. Um, you two actually separated for a little while after yeah. you got back. You'd already been separated for 15 months, <laughs> and then you get separated. Did that help or hurt? Well, that's for us, it was God's. Uh, that was God working in us. We uh, had looked to each other for answers, and neither of us had answers. We were both empty, wow. and so it took a season of being in the desert. Uh, almost like Gomer and Hosea, where I had to go far away to really figure out what was going on in me and so that I could come back to Heather and offer her something instead of trying to take something. And Darren, what was the turning point? So uh, one afternoon, um, I took the kids to meet Heather and uh, that was the first time in like a public setting where we were, we were separated. Right. And so that was the first <laughs> time I had to like release the kids. I stayed back and they ran to mom and then I turned around and got in the car and left. And so just the weight, the gravity of that situation finally slapped me in the face and, and woke me up, so to speak. And, and from there, I was, I was ready to fight for my family. And that's when I got, I had to get out of the army to do that. Wow. Um, 
the Army wanted me to stay in, but I knew that I needed time and space outside of that if I was going to have a fighting chance to win, win my wife's heart back and the kids. And Heather, how did you learn to trust Darren again? Because he had, you know, completely changed. And I guess what you didn't realize was that he was feeling guilty for not being able to save the men. At least that's what's depicted in the movie. Right. Um, but how did you learn to trust him again? I think for me, it was uh, less about learning how to trust Darren and more about learning how to trust the Lord mm -hmm. in difficult uh, situations. And so for me, it was more of um, the Lord really just kind of re re revealing His will to me for marriage and that if He's for marriage, you know, who can, how can we undo what God has, mm -hmm. has put into plan. And so for me, it was just an obedient choice to follow what the Lord's will was and trust that God was going to uh, keep me in His will and bless my children um, out of an obedient decision to stay married. And, and eventually my emotions caught up to that, right. but it did take some time. So many military families go through divorce. Now you counsel military families What's the number one thing that you tell them when they're in the situation that you guys were in? Yeah, and uh, I, my counsel to them is, and I don't understand every couple's situation. They're so drastically different. Sure. But the common denominator is one or both want out. Mm -hmm. And so just one more day, one more day. Let's keep talking about this. Let's create some space for God to break your heart for your family instead of uh, you chasing after other things and deciding that this is the best thing to do is leave your family. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. Well, your story is now headed to the big screen. It's called Indivisible. It is a powerful movie. I loved it. I did cry a few times. <laughs> um, and I love that. Um, well, I love so much about it. Uh, we don't have time to talk too much about the movie, but it comes out when? October 26th, October just 26. in a couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah. Indivisible theaters across the country. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Go to indivisiblemovie.com and you can type in your uh, zip code and it'll pop up the closest theaters to you. I really think it's a right now movie and it's a great movie for military and anybody, any, anybody, anyone to see. Yeah. Um, thanks for sharing your story Thank with you. us and uh, with the world. Uh, for more information, you can go to cvn.com. Again, Darren, Heather, thanks. God Thank bless you, you guys. Thanks. Appreciate for it. Us. Well, still ahead, time for us to tackle questions from you. One viewer writes, so often I hear churches preach the promises and blessing of God, but they never teach the true way to Christ through the cross and salvation. Why are things being sugarcoated? We'll have that question and much more coming up. Don't go away. $5 a day, that won't buy much food, will it? But that's all one grandfather had to feed his family of 13 children. Meals were skipped and some of his children got sick. But when Orphan's Promise found out about their plight, we made sure they'd never go hungry again. When Grandpa gets home, it's the best time of the day for Guile and his sister Mia. Grandpa, Grandpa, I'm hungry. The children missed lunch that day, and there was only a little bit of bread for them to share with their 11 cousins, who are all being raised by their grandparents. The children's mothers work far from home as domestic help and send only a few dollars when they can. Meanwhile, Grandpa makes only $5 a day driving a motorcycle taxi, which is never enough for food for the hungry grandkids. To be honest, there are days when we have to skip lunch because we don't have food. We'd wait until evening, hoping my husband has enough to buy dinner. My tummy hurts. Here. And Guile came down with pneumonia because of malnutrition. I felt weak. I could not play. When CBN learned about Mia and Guile, we brought our mobile medical clinic, which provided them with medicine and vitamins. Next, CBN's Orphan's Promise started a feeding program in their community. Now, Mia, Guile, and their younger cousins enjoy a nutritious lunch every day. I like going to the center. The food is yummy. We eat meat, vegetables, and rice. 
And having a place where the younger children can eat at least one meal a day has taken pressure off grandma. I'm so happy my grandchildren can eat a complete meal every day. They look healthy and feel a lot better now. Finally, Orphan's Promise gave grandma a sewing machine and everything needed to start a business making clothes and curtains. It has turned into a good source of income for the family. This sewing machine helps me meet my grandchildren's needs. Thank you for the blessings you've given us. The Bible says true religion is helping the widows and the orphans, and Orphan's Promise is doing that beautifully. Well, if you are a CBN partner, you're a part of that. You are helping those little kids, those 13 children, have healthy meals and not be sick. If you would like to be a part of what we're doing and you're not, just go to your phones right now and say, yes, I'd like to join the 700 Club. It's just 65 cents a day, $20 a month is all it takes to become a CBN partner and to help so many hurting people around the world. And uh, when you do that, we want to bless you with Pat's new teaching called Miraculous Blessings. This is a wonderful teaching that Pat's put together uh, that will bless you. And it's yours. It's our free gift to you when you give us a call right now and say, yes, I want to join the 700 Club. And it's time. All right, let's go. Bring it on. All right. Well, we don't call it bring it on anymore. We call it Honest questions, um, honest answers, I mean. Okay, so this viewer says, so often I hear churches preach the promises and blessings of God, but they never teach the true way to Christ through the cross and salvation. Why are things being sugar-coated? <laughs> why do you want to give uh, happy thoughts to get a bigger audience? That's why they do it. They, they want the church full of people, and the people seem to like that uh, uh, have their ears tickled. That's what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. The truth is, there's only one way to salvation, and that is through the cross. And he said, Jesus said, except a man uh, pick up his cross and follow me, he can't enter the kingdom. So if you want to tell it the truth, we tell it the truth. But uh, the, the truth is that having come to the Lord, there is a glorious future. It, it isn't all bad, but uh, you have to die. Then, then you come alive. I am I, I have, you know, I'm alive and now I'm dead and now I'm alive again. I mean, that's the whole idea of being born again. All right. All right. Charles says, I have a friend who's a Christian. However, in response to the fact that Trump wants to stop abortion, she said she disagrees and that it's a woman's right to choose what to do with her body. I need advice and the best way to respond to her. Um, look, uh, what is being killed is not her body. It is a uh, living human being that is the union of a man and a woman. It's not her body. And the idea of saying that it's, she has a right to do what she wants to with her body uh, is just not true. The, the, you know, they used to say abortion was murder. And then they, that sounded too harsh, so they don't say that anymore. But the truth is you are killing a human being. It is a human being. It is a person, and that person is being killed. And it's not her body. Uh, it's a, It's just one of those things. That's you know. It's it's in our society, we've sugarcoated abortion so that everybody wants to do it. It's okay. It's legal. The Supreme Court said so. There's Roe versus Wade and so forth. But it was used to be called murder. Still is. All right. All right. Raphael says, why is the only spiritual gift shown in practice on your show the gift of the word of knowledge? And how is it that each of the hosts are able to walk in this gift? Well, uh, it's one of those things that's there. The, the, really, the best one, I think, is the w word of wisdom, which has to do with uh, analysis and foretelling the future. Uh, you know, it's one of those gifts of the Holy Spirit. Read Romans uh, chapter 12. Paul sets it out what they are. And uh, he also says, earnestly desire the better gifts, especially that you might prophesy. So I think all of us need to, to yearn to be filled with God's power and to exercise all of the enablements, the charismata. Uh, they're, they're not, quote, gifts, they're charismata. And we, we all ought to need them. So, but what do we do here? I mean, you know, we see miracles. We see healing, gifts of healing, miracles. Okay. All right. Here's Ronald. He says, will you go to heaven if you're not baptized, even if you pray and read your Bible daily? Um, 
you know, Jesus said that those who go to heaven are those who do the will of my Father in heaven. That's what he wants, is for you to obey him and do the will of his Father in heaven. It's really got nothing to do with being baptized or reading your Bible every day or anything. It's doing the will of my Father in heaven. And uh, baptism is, is a, a sign where you, you, the old man is buried and raised in newness of life. It's a symbol of what goes on. Uh, but uh, I think faith is what is going to save you, not baptism or not any ritual. Well, today's Power of Men is from the book of Ephesians. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Well, tomorrow we've got uh, Tucker Carlson talking about his book, The Ship of Fools. You'll find it very interesting. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.